and welcome to House of Rugby. I am Hugh Wisencroft, joining you from Qatar. At home in our cosy studio, we've got European Cup winner Alex Good. We've got World Cup winner Rachel Burford, who has been reunited with her luggage from New Zealand, thankfully. How are you doing, guys? I'm really good, thank you. Especially now I've got my life that was in a bag back. That's great news. <laughs> and I'm great too, mate. <laughs> Good stuff, good stuff. Delighted as well to be joined by Red Rose. Harlequins player Shauna Brown is our special guest this week. How are you? Looking forward to the podcast? Yeah, looking forward to it. And I thought you were going to say Rachel's been reunited with Shauna, actually. That's what I thought. I looked at you. Gave <laughs> you the eyes. But and, no, no, it's just her bag, so I don't know how to feel right now. <laughs> It's interesting you mention uh, you don't know how to feel right now because you see, look, you're a smiley person, but of course, you know, the way that the World Cup ended wasn't the way that you wanted. How are things feeling now as the dust has settled? Um, I, I put something out on socials this week and it was just about celebrating the fact that, yes, we didn't win. Yes, it wasn't the outcome that we worked for, grafted for, but actually put it in perspective. Like we won a silver medal at our World Championships. It's pretty cool. Not a lot of the population can say they've done that. And... We played six to five minutes with 14 players. Like That alone is a, is a special achievement in itself to then only lose by three points. So I, I'm in a good place with it. I'm settled with it. And what's done is done now. Well, we want to say anyway, congratulations for everything you did. We'll talk about uh, some of the context of the competition and what I guess we can build on in terms of women's rugby in England a little bit later on. But we will also be discussing the men's side and that thrilling finale uh, at Twickenham, a draw against the All Blacks. We'll be looking ahead to the final weekend of the Autumn Nation series as well. We'll react to the World Rugby Awards where, um, uh, of course, Rachel got her glad rags on, had a great time out in Monaco. Just about, I think, uh, come down from the hangover. We'll talk about that as well and, and all the superstars that she saw. Um, but remember, if you want to get involved uh, with the podcast, drop us a message. You can drop us a voice note as well. You'll find our WhatsApp number in the description of the podcast episode, okay? We always want you to get involved. Loads of you have as well on social media reacting to the game at this weekend. Joe Marchant, our guest last week, predicted a two-point gap, I think, in that game. He almost got it perfectly right. It ended up as a draw, which most of us didn't see coming, with 10 minutes left. Fantastic final last 10 minutes of rugby at Twickenham. I wanted to ask you all, really, whether it's a case of all credit due to England in terms of that comeback or a result that papered over the cracks? Alex, I'll start with you. Um, I think it was uh, a wonderful uh, end to a game, obviously, and gave the fans something to cheer about towards the end. Um, I certainly don't think England were at their best at all um, throughout the game. And even at the end, they played better, but I think New Zealand will be more upset at how they allowed England to play, play like that. Um, there were so many big errors from them, uh, from key players. Uh, for me, Bowden Barrett going for the drop goal is, I mean, it sounds negative, but quite a selfish decision. I, I think that harmed them um, purely because, I don't think many people have mentioned it, but if they just keep playing the phases for you know 30 seconds or so, they, they try and get a try. They might not get a try, but the penalty was right in front of the post. They then come back for a penalty, you mess around a bit, you've got 90 seconds to kick a penalty, that's two minutes of time gone. You're closing out the game even more. You're taking away England's time even more so. So, you know, for no real gain, apart from him hitting a drop goal, I, I don't know what else they, they benefit from. Um, later on, Perinara with his little kick over the top. He obviously got a call, but at that stage of the game, you've got to close this out. Now, this is a New Zealand team, and those two players, very experienced. But for me, they're very experienced in successful New Zealand sides. They're now on a side which is trying to find their own way of playing, trying to find momentum. And perhaps that was the problem, that these guys are so used to closing out games by being better and just winning games with such successful New Zealand sides, they couldn't do that. And they, they opened the door enough, and then England did you know, play very well and took the opportunities, but it was because New Zealand uh, gave them opportunities. Mate, you sound like you wanted England to lose. I mean, all, I asked you whether it papered over the cracks or not, and you've just unleashed on the All Blacks. I mean, what, what? about England, mate? What, what about England? Did it paper what? over the cracks, or do you give them credit? Well, no, I, I think I, I answered it in a way, and I, I don't think they were as good in that last 10, ten minutes as, as perhaps they were made to look. I, I'm disappointed with England because I think it was a really good opportunity, and, and for a large part of that game... New Zealand were they played really well. They were a bit clever, and England didn't strike. They didn't strike in terms of the forwards and get quite get their co um, cohesion with the backs. I, and I think 
they'll be disappointed. And I thought week three, they would probably have progressed up another level from the first two weeks. So I was a bit disappointed with England, to be honest with you. And so that last 10 minutes, to answer your question definitively, I think it did paper over the cracks, yes. Shauna, what did you make of it? Um, so ultimately, I think it was there for the entertainment value. Um, I'm, I'm there as a, as a supporter, as a watcher. I just want to be entertained. And if we're talking about rugby detail, like I am not someone you come to for rugby detail. But looking at the game, it was the last 10 minutes, almost as if something just a weight released off the player's shoulders. And it's just like, what have we got to lose? Like we're down, we're at Twickenham, like nobody's in a good place, nobody's happy with us. Let's just have fun, let's play with it. And just seeing Marcus Smith being able to almost unleash himself and, and do what he does so well for Quinns week in, week out. And maybe like the structure doesn't do well for him. So it's just seeing the boys, just being able to have fun, kick the ball around, a few little dummies here and probably things that were not in the playbook and generally not in an England playbook. But it, it's good to watch and, and knowing that we've got 10 minutes left. What have we got to lose? And um, well, they went for the draw in the end, but it's the... Uh, I would have liked to see him played on because literally what have you got to lose? You, you've made everyone happy. And even if England did lose, it would still be, well, that last 10 minutes was a great show of rugby. Um, so yeah, would have preferred to um, see him play and the mo momentum was in their favour. Um, but it was a bit of a, almost a downer when they, when Marcus kicked the ball out, but it is what it is. And yeah, it was a, it was a great game and everyone like go home on the train afterwards is almost buzzing about it. So it's, it's good in terms of being a fan watching. Rachel, would you would you have liked him to carry on playing as a? And if you've been in that situation, do you think you would have, or you know, because it's easy to say in hindsight, yeah. I suppose. But if you're on the field, would you think? I I would have liked to have seen him play. Would I have made that decision on a pitch if I was that person? I don't know. It might be different. But I would have thought, you know, this is a great opportunity to find ourselves in this position, an opportunity to go and win this game. Let's see what we are about. And I think that last ten minutes really showcased some of the great attacking play that England do have but they needed the mentality of oh we've got nothing to lose we've got an opportunity here let's just play we need that from minute one we need to see that excitement unleash those players and you talked about being disappointed in the way that they didn't strike we literally had to wait to 70 minutes for them to go for a, an opportunity and I think the more bravery they have as a group um, to play more what they see then we'll get more from this England side but I, I think for where they are now, year out from the World Cup, that's a real big hole to be in. Like it wasn't great positioning on the pitch to to then try and play out of, but why not see what you've got in the bank? Uh, no, I think I go back and forth with that decision. I have done for the last couple of days because at first I was like, surely you go for it. Momentum's with you. What an opportunity to beat the All Blacks. You know, they've got 14 men. You're on the front foot. And then I sort of looked at it a bit more and thought, there's so many key players. I heard Ben Young say in the middle of the field there, they were so hell-bent on winning the, the restart that they actually chewed up sort of six, seven players and then there weren't that many options. But I guess the disappointing thing for so many fans, and, and you guys know, is if Marcus had been at Quinn's, he's probably 100% of the time he's going to have a go. Um, but that's international rugby. It's different. It's tough. Uh, I guess for me, England, they're on the right track because they're getting into the 22 a lot. I think it's that cohesion that they're not quite finishing those opportunities enough. And that's probably what did them against Argentina, struggled against New Zealand again, and just it allows teams to get away from them and them to get frustrated. I've never played international rugby, but uh, yeah, I think I'm one of those, like you, Shauna, that wants to see the crowd entertain, want to see them go for it. Imagine the roar if England win the game as well. And look, we want to bring people to rugby. It would have just been, it was already an incredible finish, but it would have been even better. And look, it's not football. You don't need to take a draw and be happy with that. Go for the win, blaze of glory. I would have been delighted with it. Anyway, it was, I think, a positive outcome, far better than a defeat to carry on into the final weekend of the Autumn Nation series. The last two games uh, kicking off on Saturday. England taking on South Africa, of course, without many of their big names, I guess. I don't know how you guys see it. England will possibly be favourites in this and can go on a real high with the victory. What do you think, Al? I think England at home. Uh, should always be favourites. Uh, home game for uh, England at Twickenham. Obviously, you should back them to win. Um, missing some some big players, South Africa, but they they are a team that are really difficult for England because they they know exactly what everyone knows what they're going to do, and they come at you. But it's really hard to stop, and they're very well matched up against England because they physically can can match us. They can meet us in the scrum, the mall. 
and their kicking game causes problems. So it's a tough game, but I think England will come through. And I think, again, it's that, that another week on, so I feel like there'll be some great opportunities for England to put those small things that didn't quite go right in the 22 against New Zealand uh, right against uh, South Africa, and you'll see some, some good tries scored. Do you also think that the way that they play in that last 10 minutes will also give them confidence as well? what they can do against such a good side I think the comeback yeah is, it will give them a lot of um, confidence the, the fact that they, they actually as you said they can move the ball well you know if they're given time and space they can do that the danger though is New Zealand, uh, South Africa won't give them any time and space so they'll be flying off the line from everywhere and they take away that but it does allow England time to think about it this week come up with some plays tighten things up and the things they did well in that last period they can still do to South Africa is just about being precise, which they didn't have in that earlier period. But certainly they'll, they'll feel good because it felt a bit like a win, as we've talked yeah. about at the end. And hopefully that will take them on to next week. And I think it'd be a really big step for England to, to get a win against South Africa. I'm not sure England will make much changes changes in their game. Um, and they'll think, oh, like it sort of worked last week, so let's do the same but better. <laughs> and yes, in terms of they'll talk about just finishing off and those one percenters at the end and potentially if we could have finished off a few more chances then last week would have been a lot different but then I think South Africa will suffocate them South Africa have the big uh, physical battle up front um, and also in their back line as well it's a big strong back line so I actually think that South Africa are going to take it this week oh wow yeah I, I think it's a, I think it's a game for England to be clever um, have to box clever when to run it when to kick it how they use the shorter kicks crossfield kicks um but you're playing a south african side who you know very dangerous there they've come off back of the tour they know they're playing willie the is playing really well yeah. and, and they're and they can cause england problems so it'll be a good test for england's defense as much as you know how they can be smart on attack rachel i i started the autumn campaign by piling as much pressure as i possibly could on Eddie Jones. Um, he's got a draw against New Zealand. Of course, he's been beaten by Argentina, got the win against Japan. What needs to happen this weekend for us to sit back, look at the uh, whole autumn as a, a whole and say, he's done a good job. It was a successful campaign. What needs to happen this weekend? Is it all about the victory? Performance, if they lose, but the, a good performance, is that enough? For me, I think performance... You know, year out from the World Cup, you want to get wins under your belt, you want to get that momentum. But ultimately, if they can perform this weekend and it's a tight game and margins are in it, then, you know, that's success to me. Um, and that's a building block. And that's something that Eddie always goes on about, making sure that they're ready for the World Cup, judge us on that. But, you know, as a group of players, you know, what success looks like for them will be definitely a win. They'll want to make sure that they win at home, win well, not saying by a, a big score line, but they'll want to win well against South Africa and really lay a statement down for, for what's coming. Hugh, what's your problem with uh, Eddie Jones, mate? <laughs> did, he not, did he not pick you or something? Listen, I asked the question at the top about papering over cracks. That's all I'm going to say. Like, that, start, that start from England, you know, the finish was so incredible. People left the stadium on such a high that they almost forgot about the dominant start from New Zealand. Yes, it's New Zealand, but remember... It's not the greatest all-black side we've ever seen, and England were way off them at the start of that game. The yellow card at the end of the game changes things. England build momentum in front of their own crowd, and they manage to get a draw. And then even then, with the momentum on their side and an extra player, they'd rather go for a draw than go for a win against the all-blacks. And again, me, I think the spirit of rugby is you go for the win there. I mean, we can debate it as much as possible. This weekend, again, I want to be positive about Eddie Jones. I honestly do. It has to be a very good performance in my eyes for it to have been a really successful campaign. Um, I just don't think we have seen an England side that is building towards something special at the World Cup. Correct me if you think I'm wrong. Well, I, I don't think... I mean, you started off by saying you thought Eddie Jones would be gone by the Autumn International. <laughs> no, I, I didn't think that. And I, I think he's the right man to take us to the World Cup. And I think England will be very good in the World Cup. But, yeah, I, I'm disappointed with the game at the weekend, of course, as, as I stated, but there's still the, this game against Africa is massive and then Six Nations will be huge. Um, I, I really do think a lot of it comes down to time together. Like Marcus and Owen haven't had loads of time together. You know, Eddie hasn't had loads of time with the players together. I, I think 
even Manu in the centres with Owen. Like it's been a while. So I think for me, they do need time. And I've probably been a bit critical in the past, but actually, really, the more time they have together, the better they'll get. And therefore, for me, in the, in the Six Nations, England will get better and better and better, and um, you'll see a, a much improved team. I think from a player's perspective, the other thing to think about is like physically and programming. So you don't have to have a finished side that's ready to play in a World Cup final at this stage. But as a as a player, your gym programs, your rugby sessions, like you're knackered. And actually, we experienced it as a as a women's side. We went into our our warm up games for World Cup, and we we were tired. Like as a team, we were tired. Our scores were down. We were tired, but constantly told by our S and C like this is a good thing. You like you don't need to be ready now physically because what we're aiming for is the World Cup final, and we need you to be physically ready for the World Cup final. So actually, from a, a physical perspective and and as a player, I don't think they should be worried that they're not the complete package yet because they they don't need to be. I, I just hope that that there's twelve or thirteen of the players who start now will be starting yeah. in the World Cup in the big games. That that's the thing we don't want to see. I don't think you want to have too many changes. And Eddie did that really well in the last World Cup. The, the squad was very settled and the team was very settled. And I think that will be key going into this World Cup. And like even through Six Nations, like consistency and selection and time together, learning from one another, like, yeah, that will be really key. I promise you, Alex, OK, I'm going to be... doesn't matter what happens this weekend. I'll, I will bring a positive point to make about England next week. Right, even if they concede 50. I, I think you just are positive for you, mate. I just don't think you're positive Eddie. Just, no, do you know, listen, maybe I'm just homesick. That must be it, all right? I'm missing you guys too much. And that's what it is. I promise you, I will be positive. I'll find something in there, even if it's a massive defeat. Fingers crossed it's not, of course. Um, we're going to move on. Before we get into Wales against Australia this weekend, let's check in with the Rugby Joe admin. What's trending today? Hello again, Alex, Rachel, Hugh, and welcome, Shauna. Hugh, come back soon. We miss you. This is Rugby Joe Admin here, returning for all your social feed needs. Trending this week is the Georgia rugby team. They've overcome all the odds to make history with victory over Wales last weekend. The internet is divided as to whether the underdogs played brilliantly or whether Wales were simply awful. Also, DIY SOS presenter Nick Knowles dropped in the comments. Can we get him on the show? I'm a huge fan. See you next week, everyone. You know, that's my voice, Shauna. <laughs> no, no, seriously. We, 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 we changed it electronically. That's me talking. They changed it. Are you joking? No, I'm dead serious. I don't believe you. No, serious. Ask you. I don't believe. I, I don't believe you. I need an adult to verify that. <laughs> an adult. Well, Rachel's not an adult. They're charming. <laughs> well, uh, I appreciate the sentiment, at least from the rugby admin this week. I appreciate her thinking of me. Uh, let's talk about Wales as well, who are also on the agenda. Then beaten by Georgia at home. They face Australia this weekend, of course, beaten by Ireland. But when we focus into events in Cardiff, I mean, it was the worst possible outcome one of the worst results in, in Welsh rugby history how bad were they Alex I'll look credit to Georgia first and foremost they have done something they've never done before and you saw the celebration afterwards that they were over the moon and you know it's amazing for rugby to see that I think if you're a Welsh fan you are deeply deeply sad about the state of affairs I think Warburton came out and spoke um, about how bad everything is and how to rip it all up and I don't know enough about the regions and the structure of it to, to answer that but it seems like things are not progressing in a good way and the results recently have been pretty bad and I think if you're a Welsh fan you'd be pretty livid and disappointed to say the least about losing to Georgia at home. Shauna, do you think Georgia showed something that we might see at the World Cup next year? Smaller nations, maybe closing the gap on some of the bigger countries, getting things right in terms of their coaching, their strength and conditioning and their game plan? Short answer, yes, because there's so much about like playing with no fear and you go into any game, any, any walk of life as an underdog. That's almost an advantage in so many situations. You've got no pressure, no worries. Like Even sometimes just scoring against a tier one nation is a big deal. So, yes, I, I think as we go into a World Cup, you're going to see more and more of it. And, and as we're seeing at the moment in the Football World Cup, there's been a few, not only goals, but defeats against the 
what are seen as the better nations and it's only good for sport and shows that how how well you can progress like you can't just sit on your laurels as a as a tier one nation like you have to keep progressing because there's people coming up behind you that are just going to keep coming for you and if you don't progress progress as well like they're going to come and get you do you agree rachel yeah i think you know that's the the unknown and that's the danger of a a tier one nation coming up against a georgia you know and they've actually run them close before so it's not no huge surprise in how they've turned out to perform and you know that everyone's been talking about getting Georgia into the Six Nations the success that they've had in previous uh, World Cup cycles and I think for Wales you know it is dire straits at the moment for them there just seems to be no you know you talked about time together and and cohesion amongst them and it just feels like there's a real lack of leadership at the moment in that team and they're just really struggling and it and I think Warburton says it right you know it kind of needs ripping up reset start again start quickly though because what's coming around the corner six nations world cup you know they don't have a lot of time to try and get this right no they don't and they need i think a big upturn in fortunes if wayne Wayne pivak is going to continue in that role because you know that was my big shout about eddie jones but he will come under huge pressure if they have a very poor six nations campaign. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, Plenty for us still to discuss. Of course, our special guest is Shauna Brown back from the Rugby World Cup. We spoke about the final a little bit earlier on. Shauna, let's talk about the experience of being at this competition as a whole, because I think so many of us back home cheering the Red Roses on still feel, despite, you know, being runners up, that there was huge impact uh, with this this competition, really exemplary, exemplary tournament. Was the experience the same for you? Yeah, so from a player's perspective, people ask me, like, how's, it, how's the experience? How's the tournament? And actually, I always surprise people and say, like, it wasn't amazing as, as a tournament. And actually, I was quite underwhelmed with the setup and, and going to a World Cup and thinking it would be something that felt really special. And at least not necessarily every, every day, but it, it should have felt a bit more special. And some of us spoke about it just to each other as players, it just felt more like an extended Six Nations in terms of the hosts and, you know, what, what was on offer um, and what we saw day-to-day, facilities, etc. cetera. Um, so, yeah, it's tough to kind of say that out loud without being ungrateful because ultimately it was still a World Cup and it's still an honour to play in it. And and us as an England team, that's, that's almost nothing to do with us. Like, we we done everything we could do but then if we look at the other side of it and the impact it's had on, I'd, I'd just say society in general, actually. And even these last couple of weeks, like I've been just going about my business on the street and people come up to me asking for photos. And I'm like, wow, like, this is cool. This is different. That would normally only happen in a in a rugby setting. And like so many people have just spoken and saying that they've watched it at half six or, or the earlier games got up at half four in the morning. And I think, wow, that's crazy. And then when you see the stats on it as well, it's something like 1.7 million people tuned in in the UK at half six in the morning. And it was actually more than watched live in on New Zealand television. But it's, yeah, the, the change has been incredible. And even being, I was at the men's game during the last Six Nations, just in hospitality, talking to people as a player. And you, you just go around and you almost have to introduce yourself a bit awkwardly because everyone knows who the men are and not quite sure that England have even got a women's team. But actually, I was at the New Zealand game last weekend and I'd walk up to a table or even just walk past the table and people would grab me and say, oh, Sean, like, well done for the World Cup. Can we have a picture? And so that is the kind of real life sea changes that we're seeing. And it, it can only grow with like the most exciting thing about women and women's rugby is how far it's got to grow. We've got almost we're almost 25 years behind the men like we're we're growing at exponential rate and it's up to everyone else to keep up and especially at England we're doing a really good job at it but I say other nations have got to keep up as well Uh, how do we um continue that growth Uh, I've asked Rachel that before it's you know we've seen Olympics where it's all about the legacy and then there's a drop-off in the sports or what happens how do we keep women's rugby at the forefront and keep it progressing forward and getting more and more people involved that's the ultimate question, though, isn't it? Someone gets paid a lot of money to answer those kind of questions. <laughs> you passing <laughs> the buck to Rachel. <laughs> yeah. oh. that's, that's why she was in Monaco, I think. Uh, yeah, I feel like, Rachel, you're quite good at this kind of thing and legacy and talking and stuff. So you'd like me to answer it again? <laughs> Please. 
we've got to just maximise these guys in front of as many people as possible, whether that's through your screens, whether that's live in the stadiums, getting them out. You went to your school yesterday, yep. back mm -hmm. in school. Ellie Kildun did the same yesterday at her yeah. school. You know, we've got to keep inspiring young people to want to watch the game, and not just young people, but just anybody to come and watch the game. And, and I think you're right, like that whole kind of, like the sea change around the game is massive. And what we need to maximise it, just like you said, Alex, like we can't just kind of have this incredible tournament that's happened and this platform that all these players are on. But the great thing is we've got fixtures in a couple of months. Then we've got another global competition and then another global competition and then we're hosting the World Cup. You know, the Black Ferns, we don't know when they're going to play at home again. So they've done all that incredible work, all that great inspiring work, but they're not going to have anybody, they're not going to be watched for yeah, who knows like, how long. It's almost like what next? And we, I went to a community event while we were over there and it was a girls festival they had loads of teams from both North and South Islands and it was like the biggest festival that they ever run. And I can't remember the numbers, but I'm going to say it was something like 40 teams there and it was like the biggest girls festival they've ever had and they was all raving about it. And then I thought, I know Leanne Infante runs a girls festival every year in Guildford and she has twice that amount of girls there. So it's not to say that they're not trying, but like Rachel says, it's, it's like the progression of what what's next. And to be fair to England rugby, us as a, as a women's team are playing next six nations standard our first standalone fixture england versus france at twickenham and that'll be the first time it's ever done and it's just things like that because that gives us confidence as players that other people believe in us and so therefore we want we want to play to crowds we want to play to more people we want to impress people you just got to give us a platform and at the moment I, like england rugby are doing really well with it you, I guess, inspire people to watch the game. That's one thing. But I think you can talk about your story and the fact that you came to rugby late because there might be some people thinking, I really enjoyed watching the Red Roses. You came into the sport at 25 years old and have obviously become an international. Now, that is hugely inspiring for anyone that wants to get into the game itself, not just those that want to go and watch you know, a, a club game or want to watch on TV. They can actually become rugby players themselves, of course, if they've got that natural talent. Also, we want people to come into rugby from different communities. Now, you're from Kennington, or as we say, Kennington. Uh, there was a huge mural, mural of you. <laughs> it's true, though, isn't it? Um, there was a huge mural of you in Kennington. Now, there was... That must have been a special moment to see your face up there. You know, a bit like Marcus Rashford had a mural during the Euros. You had one for yourself. What was that like? Um, I love it. I I do love seeing my face everywhere. But it, it was more <laughs> the fact that it was a, a graffiti Great, mural. <laughs> and like, it's, it's graffiti. Like, it's not seen... Graffiti is not proper. You know what I mean? It's like underground. Yeah. Some people would call it art. Some people would like call it just trash and something. So it's what graffiti itself stands for. But then also the fact that it's on the side of the oval. And I, do you know what I mean? It's cricket. I ain't got a clue about cricket. And I'm learning. <laughs> I'm trying my best to learn. But like growing up, cricket was not a thing. It's not something we've done in school or anything like that. So again, it's just that different type of person who plays cricket. And then there's just me, like you say, from Kennerton slash Peckham slash Nunhead slash Newcross just chilling on the side of the oval and and someone said yes to it like someone said can we put a graffiti mural of Sean on your wall and they're gone yeah all right um but and, and again rugby is is a whole different world so like you said age 25 when I started um didn't grow up playing rugby because it seemed like rugby was a whole different world so yeah just um proud of what I'm doing but like it's weird now because I get more of, of a buzz by empowering other people to play rugby then like I love playing of course because it's full contact where else can you get paid to have a fight for 80 minutes like not many places and I love it but it's more getting other people <laughs> to realize the power of it and, and I'll say it every day of the week like sport has shaped my entire life and I, I have a great life and it's entirely because of sport and I would always encourage anyone to just just try and get involved and also you could have your face on the edge of um the oval in South London are you, yeah. are you, are you sure your friends who obviously did the graffiti. You sure they actually are? So you just, you just go out one night <laughs> and wait. Hey, you know, I've got a great idea. I'm going to put you know, your face up here. No worries, they'll never, they'll never complain. It's true, but I did see those like cones around it. When is it? So there's cones. Do you know what I mean? Got an how, high vis jacket. How many times have you been there to look at it? I've not actually been yet. I've not been. I, I am due to go, but there's a few people have sent it to me. And even before it was up properly, I just had a couple of my mates. Again, nothing to do with rugby because it's right in the middle of. Um, it was right on the oval. Um, so I had a few mates. Sure not. Um, I've just driven past the oval and I think your face is going on the wall. And I'm like, what are you talking about? 
it's not finished yet, but it couldn't be anyone else. I look at it and it's you, and I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. And um, yeah, so I've not, I've not actually been there yet, but it is, it is on the to do list to get many, many pictures with it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it is amazing. Sh- yeah. oh, sorry, I mean, it is amazing, and it's funny you mentioned cricket because I noticed there was a, a real c- cricket theme with the red roses out in New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was you a lot. You said you're getting a bit better. <laughs> you know, were you improving towards the end? Were you more a bat- batter, bowler? <laughs> Where were you, where or was a stand by Um I like watching. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, so I'm not very good, but it, it, things in general, I'm not good. But if somebody teaches me how to do things, like I've always been told, I'm very coachable. So and Rachel knows because she tries to teach me how to pass, and I try and learn, but we're not quite there yet. But if someone teaches me, so if anybody wants to teach me how to bowl and how to bat properly, I'm all for it. But yeah, there was a lot of cricket going on in Red Roses camp and I generally watched. And also learning the scoring system is so complex because I became a fan of the 100 because it's 100 balls. I can get on board with that. But the whole T20 stuff, I watch it. I've not got a clue what's going on. And not a clue. just quickly then, best and worst players? Oh, Ellie Kildan as a bowler okay. is, is a fantastic sight to see. And Connie Powell and Jess Breach actually as a bowler. It's a very entertaining sight to see. Um, best batters like Emily Scarrett she's good at everything she used say. to play rounders for England is that a thing? yeah oh, is that wow. a thing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool is that a thing? <laughs> tell her that she should be really happy it's on a Wikipedia page <laughs> <I do. laughs> I've got to say, I do like the fact that you basically set your targets on the next Cricket World Cup during this podcast. No, no, so you all no, no, it no, first. No, no. Someone who, by the way, when you said that sport had been your whole life, we do need to tell everyone you, you were competing at the Commonwealth Games in Hammer. You've also boxed professionally, obviously rugby union as well. So a super athlete, how far are you going to take it? Are you setting your sights on the Rugby World Cup in England in 2025? Are you hoping to set the record straight in that final? Um, I set my sights about a week in advance at all stages in my life. So when people say, oh, what have you got planned for the future? I go, I don't know, like, have you got anything for me? And that's, that's kind of how I've lived and it's worked so far as we go. So yeah, any opportunities, I just like to take them and like reading a book at the moment from um, Shonda Rhimes, A Year of Yes, and you just try and say yes to as many opportunities as possible. And it's, like I say, it's got me where I am so far. So I wouldn't like to stop that. But in terms of what's next, Go back to Quinn's, play some rugby, um, enjoy rugby, a bit of um, just a bit of freedom rugby as well. So yeah, I I won't give you any guarantees, you as to what's next. <laughs> She's non-committal. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes, we'll yes, see. Exactly we shall that. see. Well, everything you seem to touch turns to gold. So best of luck with the future, and hopefully we see you out there in the World Cup in 2025. I tell you what, remind me not to play rugby against you professional boxer and I think you mentioned that you just love love assaulting people in rugby so is it assault I, if it's rugby well, yeah, exactly so <laughs> not for me but moving on to the world rugby awards Rachel you were there in Monaco this weekend can you remember any of it or can you give us some detail I actually can remember some of it um my croaky voice is still from the weekend um no it's a amazing um evening celebrating all the great rugby players, all the tournaments, etc. Um, like kicked off with beatboxing. So okay. just we, we can see world rugby and the, the world of rugby is taking a turn, right? That's oh like that's planned that, professional beatboxing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. So they started and then it's they a were bit like, like a graffiti mural. <laughs> <laughs> so, so not a magician, you know, not a singer. Not an opera not singer. A, yeah. No, we're gonna go in with a beatbox. And they, and they were like, who likes drum and bass? <laughs> so most people knew what drum and bass was, but it's obviously a lot of an older generation That's as well. There are a few committee or uh, women going, what's going on? Bill That's Beaumont so was like this. <laughs> yeah. No, it was really cool. Um, you know, celebrating a lot of successes over the last year. Um, we obviously did a few predictions last week and you got it right, Alex. Well done. Tick. Thank you. Yeah, it wasn't the hardest one. I thought it would do all right. But Abby Dow got try, try of the year. Oh, she was I mean, so nervous. Was she? She was like, she was like, if I win, what do I say? What, what? And honestly, she was so scared, but she absolutely smashed it up on stage. It was amazing. And and you guys, I mean, maybe not so much yourself, but happy with Wayne Smith getting Coach of the Year there? I just think, you know, how how can you transform a team in such little time from where they were completely down and out, got absolutely smashed by England and France, then go on to beat them? Yeah, I think it was a fair call that he won. I, I'll, I'll agree. 
as well yeah. in the fair call. That's fair. And, and just give us a little bit about Ruby Tui, you know, you know what she likes to play against, how much detail went into trying to analyse her, because she got breakthrough uh, Women's Player of the Year. Yeah. You know, what, what was it well, like? she hangs out on the wing, and I'm a prop, so playing against her is not something really directly I come across. I don't know if you know. Hey, you had a line break down the wing. Yeah, I did. You did. <laughs> you World Cup final. Yeah. I did, I did. Yeah, I caught was... Ruby <laughs> the entire World Cup final just giving it chat. Oh, would yeah. be like, Holly, Holly, Holly. Like, yeah, I don't, yeah. I obviously don't know what she was saying, but yeah, just so constant, was, um, like, trying she, to distract her. Well, chat? no, I think it, like, genuinely just asking how someone's day went. I think one of them, she just said, oh, I'm not she just no, to talk. No, I, I think she just told one of the other girls, oh, I spent yesterday with your mum, like as in on an adventure. They went on an adventure with someone's mum, something like that. Just well, genuinely yeah, I good, mean, like honestly, nice. You say that, and I think, boys, chat. <laughs> no, no. I spent there with your mum. I'm like, no, no, where no, are we no, going no, with no. this? Like, Can you try it this weekend and see what I happens? Mean, like, give I, it a go. That was quite a 90s chat. <laughs> you know, I just went on a tourist you know excursion. I mean? like, Come on, we can't no, get past no, that. No, no. I don't wow. think she meant like that. Oh, obviously not, but. I automatically go back to the 90s there. Right, okay. It's a high level banter we're having here. Yeah. I mean, may maybe it was that, but I think she, I think she genuinely, she might have went kayaking or something, like went on a hike or something with someone's mum the day or a couple of days before when she was just pointing it out on pitch in a World Cup final. This is, yeah. this is really yeah. got odd. Yeah. I actually don't know what to say now. Um, very anyway, confused. Well done, Ruby. Well, I'm then. not being the World Cup final, but this is this is quite odd chat. You know, it's not sledging. Yeah, odd. It's odd. friendly conversations about how I hang out with your mum. So before it but turns worse, just on Ruby last time. So obviously it was in the media around her giving a World Cup medal away to a young young girl who overcome cancer. But they presented her with a World Cup medal on the stage that evening, which she was totally surprised about, which was a really wonderful moment. <laughs> oh, well, you was going to say, and then she gave that one away too. <laughs> no, I they said that. line to that story, because it was a really good story, and then it just Ended. didn't sound as sincere and as kind as it could have done. But let's move on quickly. This this whole area has a gone, it has gone it. just so <laughs> wrong. But um, Josh Van der Fleer got Men's Player of the Year. Still can't believe Ali Surveyor wasn't on the list. Um, predictions, please. Rachel, England versus South Africa first. England are going to win by eight. England by three. No, sorry. You said South Africa. You no, can't I change. Just, I just listened to what Rachel South Africa by three. No, three, three. Uh, England by two for me. Uh, Wales, Australia? Mm. <laughs> Australia by two. Never allowed back to Wales. I'm going to say <laughs> Australia by ten. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think it's been a huge backlash from Wales, and I think they'll do the yeah. end of tour, the, the dust now. Um, so uh, they won't be able to have their international players either. So I think, so Will Skelton won't be playing and stuff like that. So I think Wales by three. And I'm allowed back oh. into Wales. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> yeah, lucky me. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's episode three done. Shauna, thanks so much for joining us. I hope it was all right for you. Thanks for being here. I've been thoroughly entertained this evening. Well, uh, it's been a brilliant edition of House of Rugby. Big thanks to Shauna, Alex and Rachel there in London. Remember, House of Rugby, back with you next week. We'll give the Autumn Nation Series our end-of-season report, if you like. We'll be giving them grades A to F. Until then, class is dismissed. But remember, uh, you can, of course, check out WhatsApp. See the number there uh, in the description. It's open for your messages and voice notes. Make sure you get involved. And we'll see you next time.